Hi everyone, this is River Navarro. I'm the Director of Clinical Services here at Bakersfield Behavioral Healthcare Hospital. Welcome to Lunch and Learn. Uh, the topic of the day is depression. Um, and I chose that topic because uh, we've been getting so many questions about that. So I wanted to take some time to respond to um, some of the questions and the inquiries that we're receiving. So um, this will be informational in nature. Um, so I wanna start out by talking about the difference between depression and what used to be called seasonal affective disorder. Okay, so uh, we have our major depressive disorder and then we have um, what we call, um, it's, it's called a specifier, but what it means is some people have major depressive disorder during certain times of the year. And that's where the season, with seasonal pattern comes in, okay? So some people um, have depression at specific times of the year. It's usually uh, fall or winter, um, although there are cases that are sometimes occur in summer months, but the idea is it has a seasonal pattern to it. It tends to occur around a certain time of year. Um, for people that have seasonal depression in fall and winter, um, sometimes it's because of the lack of sunlight. You know, we get our energy from the sun. And um, because the weather's more gloomy, it's darker, um, you know, some people are more sensitive to the weather. And so that can result in cases of major depressive disorder with seasonal pattern or what used to be called seasonal affective disorder. Uh, whereas major depressive disorder can really occur, you know, any time, um, you know, regardless of what time of year it is and there's no seasonal pattern to it. Um, so I wanna kind of give you some information since that tends to be a little more common. Most people have major depressive disorder without that seasonal pattern. So I just wanted to kind of explain the difference for a minute. Um, so this is what you would look for, right? Signs, symptoms, that kind of thing. And all the information I'm giving you is from the DSM-5. Uh, that is what, you know, people in my field use, um, you know, psychiatrists, therapists, psychologists, um, you know, people providing clinical care to patients. This is what uh, we would use here uh, for diagnosing, if that makes sense. So the DSM-5 is kind of like our manual that, that we use for diagnosing. Um, that stands for um, Diagnostic, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. That's the whole thing, but we call it the DSM-5 for short. So according to the DSM-5, these are symptoms that you would want to look for um, if you think maybe you have a family member, a friend, someone you know, um, these are, this is what you would observe about them if you're suspecting that maybe they're struggling with depression. So um, I'm gonna go through a list of symptoms. Keep in mind, the person has to have these symptoms, at least five of them for a minimum of two weeks, okay? So this is pretty much most of the day, most of the time for every day for a two week period, okay? So that's kind of what you're looking for. Um, those are your time frames and these are the symptoms. Uh, depressed mood or loss of interest in pleasure, okay? Where just nothing really, they're not really deriving any sort of pleasure out of life or maybe from things that they used to enjoy. Um, you would know what those things were. Uh, maybe they're not interested in hobbies that they were doing before. Um, you know, uh, maybe they're spending more time in bed. They're spending more time isolating um, where just, even if you know they used to get excited at meal times and like they just kind of don't really feel like eating. Um, they don't really seem excited. Um, even about maintaining relationships sometimes. If you know that person well, you'll know what those things are. Um, if you've noticed any type of significant weight loss or gain in a short period of time, of course, this wouldn't be due to a medical condition, you know, if, or if they were, you know, sick um, in some way where maybe they couldn't eat, 
you know, it wouldn't be due to that. It would be because they're either overeating um, to soothe or they're just not eating, right? Because they have no appetite. You want to look for insomnia or hypersomnia. So sleeping difficulties. Um, you're, you've noticed a change in their sleeping patterns. Maybe they're staying up all night now and they're just, you know, saying they can't sleep and they don't know why. Um, but it's, it's really becoming a problem and impacting them during the day. Or on the flip side, they're in bed all the time and you can't seem to get them out because they're just so exhausted or so tired all the time. Um, any type of restlessness or you notice the person moving or behaving in a much slower way. So in our field, we call this psychomotor agitation or retardation. Um, that's referring to physical movements. Um, the person is just like really slowed down. Um, that could be due to lack of energy um, or they're just restless, hyperactive, can't really sit still, seem kind of on edge. Um, if you know what this person's like most of the time, you'll know when this happens because it'll be um, drastically different than how they normally present. You want to look for um, fatigue, which I kind of mentioned already, just feeling exhausted all the time, uh, loss of energy. Um, extreme feelings of guilt or worthlessness. Um, you might hear them making statements um, that seem to be impacting them. Um, so maybe they're being really hard on themselves. Um, what they're expressing maybe seems a little over the top for the situation, um, more so than what a, a person would normally feel um, in a situation. So. Um, you'll, you should know kind of what that is. Um, trouble thinking or concentrating. And lastly, you want to look for, um, you know, talking about death, recurrent thoughts of death, and or suicide. Um, maybe they're suicidal thoughts with or without a plan. Okay, so not everyone who has recurrent thoughts of death or even suicidal thoughts has a plan, but this would of course be out of character for that person or this might be a change in what you've heard them talk about before. Um, keep in mind, just a couple other things, their symptoms have to cause significant impairment, okay? So what that means is it has to interfere in some aspect of their life, whether that's work, school, um, it's impacting their relationships, maybe they're not able to do the things that they did before because their symptoms are so severe. Um, you know, maybe they're not able to, um, whether it's clean their house, take care of their kids, um, you know, they're not able to, uh, maybe they're missing days of work because they can't get out of bed. Um, you know, it has to be debilitating or it has to be severe um, in some way where an aspect of their life is, is um, significantly impaired now. And you also wanna keep in mind, the symptoms are not due to a medical condition and it's not due to substance use, okay? So sometimes people have maybe a substance use disorder and a mental health disorder that does occur frequently, right? Or maybe because of medical conditions, so some of these symptoms can seem or be related in this situation, these are psychological symptoms that don't have any relationship to um, a medical condition or a substance use disorder, or, or they would be completely separate from that. Um, so having said all that, um, I wanna kind of give you some information about maybe what to do if you're suspecting that your loved one, your friend, your person, whoever that may be, is suffering from depression. Just some little tips, things to keep in mind. Um, it is okay to talk to them about what you've observed, okay? So I think a lot of people tend to shy away from talking about mental health in general. Um, maybe we're afraid to talk about it because it makes us uncomfortable. 
Um, sometimes we say we don't want to make the other person uncomfortable, but really what we're saying is we're uncomfortable. Um, so it's really important to be honest and be open and truthful about um, talking with this person about what you've observed, um, changes in behavior, um, maybe they're saying things like kind of like, hey, you know, I noticed you've been talking a lot about death or you've been talking a lot about worthlessness, guilt, you know, hey, can we talk about that? Um, you know, it's okay to speak with them openly about that. Um, you're not going to make them worse. You're not going to, uh, I hope you don't upset them, um, you know, but the idea is you're coming from a place of concern and you're focusing on behavioral observations, okay? You're sticking to the evidence, I like to say, right? I've noticed these changes in your behavior and, you know, I'm concerned that maybe you're struggling with depression and I'd like to talk to you about that, right? Or I'm here to support you and you can talk to me about that. Sometimes that's all that person needs. They just need to know you're there to support them. So, also, you might want to check in with the person um, a about a couple of things. So self-care is one of them, right? That's something you might want to be assessing or you might want to be checking. I mean, are they showering? Are they eating? Are they taking care of um, what we call activities of daily living? Are they taking care of those basic things that they would normally do throughout their day, right? Like washing their face, brushing their teeth, their, all their hygiene stuff. Um, you know, after they eat, do they do the dishes? You know, just those little things that um, you've seen them do where you know they do. So you might want to observe that. Um, you can talk to them about whether they are receiving treatment or not, right? It's okay to say, oh, well, have you talked to a professional about that? Are you, um, have you ever taken medication for that or been assessed by a professional for medication management or um, have you had any type of mental health treatment before? Have you done that in the past? Is that something you're thinking about now? Um, you know, there are people that can help you, right? So you might want to start checking in with them if you're noticing some of these symptoms and you're concerned. Um, so history of treatment, medication management, um, self-care, activities of daily living, and lastly, um, you know, be a safe person. So if you uh, don't be afraid to not just support the person, but offer to assist them, right? So if they need help scheduling an appointment, if they need help, um, you know, either receiving services or um, going to an appointment, right? So, I mean, I've taken friends and family members to uh, mental health appointments, to uh, psychiatric appointments, um, to their primary doctor to um, get a referral um, for outside treatment, so on and so forth. So you don't have to know all the ins and outs of the system, but you know, consider if maybe they are interested in mental health treatment, asking them if that's something, you know, ask if they need assistance with that or, you know, are you doing this virtually? Are you doing this in person? Is this something you need assistance with? Can I help you in any way? Um, and, and being there for that person, that would be helpful. Um, where to go for help? So this is where a lot of people get stuck. It's like, okay, I have this family member, but like now I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Um, so these are just a couple ideas, of course. Um, you know, and some of this is tied into, you know, insurance, sometimes it's not, um, so on and so forth. But these are some starting points. Um, go to a mental health clinic, or you can call them, right? Because we're in a pandemic. Um, it might be easy to just call and maybe get some information, um, look up some local places online um, if you're not sure. But any mental health clinic should be able to answer some basic questions about whether they can assist you or whether they can provide you um, with a referral. Someone can speak to their primary doctor. If they have a doctor, they can speak to that person about it, right? If they are concerned that maybe they're struggling with depression or they're having these symptoms that don't seem to be medically related, many primary doctors can give a referral 
um, to a specialist. Um, another option is you can always call BBHH, right? You can call us if you need information. Um, you can call our intake department and um, they can give you some information um, or you can ask them some questions, kind of where do I start? It, I'm not sure what to do. Um, you can always, uh, depending on the situation, if you or the family member is um, symptoms are getting worse or something like that and you're really concerned, um, you can come here any time of the day or night for a free confidential assessment, right? That's always a starting point, getting that assessment. Um, if it doesn't meet criteria for being admitted here, um, our intake department can also give you referrals, right, to outside community sources, people that can assist you if someone doesn't need to be hospitalized. Um, another option is um, if you are, you know, in Bakersfield, Kern County, so on and so forth, you can go to the Psychiatric Evaluation Center as well, um, especially if you're a Medi-Cal recipient or something like that. Um, they can assist as well, they, they will assess there. Um, they do have people that if you're you know, experiencing a crisis or you think you might be, um, they can assist as well. Um, and also helping get you linked up to services in the community. So um, when to seek help? I think this is where um, a lot of people have questions kind of like how do I know or um, when, when, when do I need to seek help? And I'm gonna tell you a couple of things about that. So if you're having any type of mental health symptoms, it is always a good idea to address that with a professional, right? That's the therapist in me talking. I'm gonna say your mental health is just as important as your physical health. So if you're noticing some of the symptoms that I talked about earlier, um, why wait till it gets really, really bad and unmanageable, right? When you could be preventative um, and, and start getting treatment now, um, whether it's just counseling, um, whether or not you think you might need medication, you know, that, that may or may not be for everyone, um, but there's options, right? So I like to say it's, always a good time to get help, I guess. Um, however, for those of you who, I think you'll know when symptoms are getting worse and if you feel that's happening, you or your family member has had these, these symptoms consistently for at least a two week period, that's kind of the time frame I mentioned, um, that's a good time um, to seek help especially if you or your loved one is having suicidal thoughts with or without a plan, right? That's probably going to warrant some type of treatment. So I say sooner ra rather than later is um, probably the best approach. But if you're, you know, kind of going into past this two week mark or, or you're just noticing major changes in a person in a short period of time, that might be a good time to start, you know, reaching out in the community, talking to a doctor, uh, coming to BBHH or contacting us to see if an assessment is needed, um, going to the local crisis center that I mentioned, right? So um, other than that, um, you know, we look forward to answering any other questions you have or addressing any concerns from the community. I hope this information was helpful to you and until our next Lunch and Learn, we'll see you then. Bye.